afternoon. It's great to be with you and have this opportunity to step into God's Word together. We are in a Lenten study written by Will Willimon, and um, the title of it is Thank God It's Friday, Encountering the Seven Last Words from the Cross. Um, Willimon, as he wrote this, his purpose was to reveal to us um, the, the depths of the heart of God for us and also to have us prepared for Holy Week that we have a new sense of gratefulness and a new desire to follow the way of Jesus for the sake of the world. Our hymn is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Um, the message that we're considering this week is the I thirst quote from Jesus. <clears throat> Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some Melioda sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of God's redeeming love. I'm going to try that a little lower. Here I, here I find my greatest treasure, hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger bought me with his precious blood. Um, I have not heard from anyone this week about um, pressing prayer concerns. We have a few members who have adult children who've been out of work for a while be, during COVID and are still seeking employment. So keep them in your prayers. Marilyn Scanlon reported that her son that you've been praying for when he broke his hip is progressing nicely through rehab and, and uh, he's still got a little ways to go, but he's doing well. Um, and Georgia Clark did tell me that she's having a bout of the shingles. And so um, she, she said the medication that they gave her quick, you know, early on when she realized she had it uh, seemed to have helped relieve a lot of it. Do Emily, do you or Ken have anything? Um, let's have a word of prayer. Good morning, Father. We, your children, gather in this continuing pandemic saga. We, we have a few folks gather here and a few folks gather there and a lot of our gathering is done through the gift of technology. And we are so ever thankful that at least we have that way of keeping connected. And we are ever so thankful also, Father, for the vaccinations that have been made available to us. And our hope is that soon we will be able to, to gather um, more like we did before the pandemic began. We ask for your continued grace during this time worldwide where people are faced with infection from this virus and the long range, in some cases, the long range effects of it. And we ask for your protection to be poured out and also for your loving grace to be poured out on those who 
have contracted the disease and are struggling and who are who have loved ones that are struggling and for those who have lost loved ones during this time of pandemic even though it is a time that is fraught with despair and frustration and confusion father we turn to you we take a good strong look at you our god who is sovereign and who is faithful ever faithful and so we trust you to carry us through this and not only do we trust in you to carry us through but we recognize that the way you work we will experience blessings out of this that there will be good news for us during this just as jesus suffered on the cross with a time of despair you don't ever let us end in despair father because after his crucifixion and his death there was the glory and victory of the resurrection and that is a promise for us too father that that the despair is never the end your good news is at the end we thank you for the chance today father to look into your word and to have our hearts touched and to have our beings changed to be more and more like the like you and your kingdom and we seek from the depths of our heart not only to be changed for ourselves, but to be changed in order that we might point others to you, that they might find the abundant life that you have promised for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn together to the opening and read that together. Almighty God, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross. Grant that we may share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Um, we are on the fifth word, and uh, I will remind you that these were every word spoken by Jesus on the cross are not numbered one, two, three, four, that these, the messages of Christ, there were seven messages of Christ spoken from the cross, and they did not happen, we do not have a recording of the exact um, sequence from which they were spoken. This is just the fifth one we're going to consider. And the message is, I thirst. It comes from John 19, verses 28 and 29. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. I will pause there for just a minute. Scholars seem to think that the reference there that scripture would be fulfilled may go back to Psalm 69, 21, which uh, says, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. And that reference uh, that scripture would be fulfilled could be related to that scripture. Verse 29 in John continues, a jar of wine vinegar was there, and so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Two quick notices there. The wine vinegar was the cheap form of wine that the commoners um, most often drank. And then we have the stalk of the hyssop plant. And um, 
hyssop in the Old Testament was an herb or a plant that was used for ceremonial cleansing. And so um, it's thought that John here was adding the symbolism in of the stalk of making sure that was mentioned, the stalk of the hyssop plant in order to emphasize that by his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus was cleansing us. So Jesus said, I am thirsty. Have you ever really thought about that? How can it be that the Son of God could be thirsty? In previous messages that we've looked at of Christ from the cross, um, all the ones that we have considered were mostly theological concepts. We talked about Jesus speaking about, Father, forgive them. So the concept of forgiveness. Uh, we talked about the fact that he quoted Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That he was experiencing as we do in this human existence. There are times that we experience despair that feels to us as if we have been forsaken by God. He also spoke uh, from the cross to John and to his mother. Um, and we, we, in the lesson, considering that scripture, woman behold thy son, son behold thy mother, um, that Jesus was really emphasizing that he was creating a new family that went beyond our biological families. And then there was the conversation with the thief in which he assured him a place with him that day in paradise. So all of those are sort of theological questions, but this one seems to be different. Now, as Jesus suffocates and bleeds to death, his own physical concerns are lifted up and he says, I'm thirsty. Jesus, the Word made flesh, the incarnation of God on earth mixes the spiritual which he has been which he has been addressing with the physical the fleshly he mixes the heavenly with the earthly and no one is better for that than Christ because he was fully human and fully divine on the cross we encounter one of the most horrible physical events, nails through flesh. There's sweat and blood and all of it is for our benefit. This is Christ's first self-referential remark, I thirst. Here is Jesus who is God come to earth and because we are, are so aware that Jesus is God come to earth, we're so aware of his divinity, we have this tendency to keep him up, lifted up on a pedestal above the particulars of life that we all experience. Um, but now these words from the cross, I thirst, force us to acknowledge that Jesus is indeed flesh too, and his suffering is real. The blood, the sweat, the torn flesh, the pain, the struggling for breath are all real. Sometimes we are so overwhelmed by human need in this earthly experience. I know um, my husband is at home and watches uh, the news a lot. And the channel that he watches has frequent commercials of suffering animals and asking for support for the SPCA and 
pictures of children who are suffering and, and um, they are trying to raise money to alleviate the suffering of the starving children. And he said, I don't know how many times I can listen to that and have my heart so broken, you know, by it. But the truth is frequently in today's world of media, we are so inundated with human suffering from around the planet that we have this tendency to eventually become a little numb to it. And, and we don't respond with uh, compassion and empathy and so it appears here that in the crucifixion, it is necessary for us to be fully aware of the suffering of Jesus. So he's giving voice to his need with a simple, I thirst. We here in the modern world, um, may never have experienced extreme thirst where like David and uh, like David, our tongue, it said in the Psalms, David quote is quoted as saying, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. He was so thirsty. That was in Psalm 22. Um, but the people of Jesus's day, the people who first heard Jesus say, I thirst, they understood thirst and the danger of thirst. Um, they lived day to day in an arid land where water was one of the most valuable resources and where we take it for granted until times like the storm when pipes broke and we were without water or we had to boil it before we could use it. Um, they were aware on a daily basis that life does not exist without water. Um, there, without water, there is no life. So um, we, we have this first level of Jesus saying, I thirst as a reminder or a lifting up that this is real and it is suffering happening to a real human being. Um, and then we look at this other possibility of, uh, that's sort of an irony. This fifth message is really curious in light of the fact that Jesus repeatedly said during his time of ministry that he was the ultimate thirst quencher. He made the claim many times to the woman at the well in John 4, 13 through 14, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In John 6, 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And in John 7, 37 through 38, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So here are a few of his claims about being the ultimate thirst quencher. And now, now he's thirsty. So this I thirst must mean more than we were talking about before, that Jesus was not only divine, but also human. That's one point of his saying, I'm thirsty, but there's another level to the interpretation of I'm thirsty. In the Bible, to thirst is usually for more than water. It means to long for, 
to be desperate for. In the beginning of the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, Jesus spoke, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So here, Jesus is relating thirst to a right relationship with God, that that is what the human spirit truly thirsts for, just as our bodies thirst for water. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. One of my favorite uh, scriptures from Psalm 42, one through two, um, covers this concept of thirst. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? Uh, some of you've heard me tell this uh, illustration before, but it's a vivid one to me. Um, my husband used to run marathons, and one of the things he learned was it was good to do carb loading before a marathon because that was re energy that would be released later as he ran. And the other one was to stay hydrated before the race and during the race and after the race. It's really important for runners in marathons to stay hydrated. And then there was an article in the paper one day about an elite runner who was, was running in uh, international competition. And as she came into the arena and the finish line was in sight, she collapsed. And it turned out that she was dehydrated. And Burke and I were both astounded. We were like, how could an elite runner allow themselves to become dehydrated? But the more I thought about it, and in respect to the meaning of thirst in Scripture, don't we allow that to happen to ourselves sometimes? We become a little complacent about staying, um, staying so soundly in the Word and staying so soundly in daily prayer with our Father that our spirits become dehydrated. And yet we know where to be filled. We know where to get our thirst satisfied. Jesus blessed people there in that first statement from Matthew 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He blessed people who were overwhelmed with the desire to be with God and to see God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Unfortunately, often uh, we are too satisfied with things the way they are to realize how thirsty our spirits are. St. Augustine once wrote, our hearts are restless. Uh, you could substitute the word thirsty there. Our hearts are thirsty until they find rest in thee. There is a parchedness in us that can only be satisfied by God. Uh, you'll probably laugh at this, but some of you are from my same generation. And the Rolling Stones, a popular band during the time, had a very popular song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Why is that? Because we search for satisfaction in places that are not going to satisfy us. Our satisfaction comes in God. Jesus was undoubtedly on the cross. He was undoubtedly physically dehydrated, but he also was thirsty for more than water. He was thirsty that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And maybe there's even another point to be considered in this discussion of thirst. 
maybe Christ was thirsty for us. I'll give you a minute to think about that. Throughout Scripture, God is seeking to gather us to Himself. He thirsts for us. He wholeheartedly gives Himself over to us. He is unashamed to get close to us. Psalm 23, 6 says, Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That Hebrew word there uh, that's translated in this as follow, which we are most familiar with, could also have been translated as pursue. And in some cases in Scripture, that same original word was translated as pursue. That gives sort of a different perception to it, doesn't it? It's one thing to have goodness and mercy follow us, sort of tag along with us. But if you use the word pursue, Surely your goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. Pursuit means it hunts us down. It chases us. Surely goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. God is determined, Scripture tells us. It's shown in Scripture it's shown through creation, through the words of the prophets, through the teaching of the law, through the birth of Christ. He's determined to get close to us. God has this thirst or longing to have us, even us. In 1893, Francis Thompson wrote a poem called The Ode I mean, called The Hound of Heaven. It's a poetic ode. Um, and before I go over it anymore, I want to tell you, this is a person who spent his life in extreme poverty as a choice uh, for religious reasons. He also suffered from ill health and at a certain point in his life had an addiction to opium. And he was dead by the age of 48 from tuberculosis. His most famous poem that he wrote was Hound of Heaven. It's 182 verses that describes the pursuit of the human soul by God. And it begins like this. I fled him down the nights and down the day. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth ways of my own mind in the mist of tears. I hid from him. And it ends with God's voice. Whom will thou find to love thee, sinner? Save me, save only me. All which I took from thee, I did not take to harm you, but that you would seek it in my arms. All that's lost, I've stored for you at home. I am the one, I am he whom thou seekest. God is the one who satisfies our thirst. We thought that if there was going to be business between us and God, humans have this tendency to think that we must somehow get ourselves up to God. But despite our best efforts, we couldn't make it to God. And then God came down to us, all the way down to the cross. And he still 
stoops into your life and mine. God is in this fix. God is on the cross because God is so thirsty to satisfy our thirst. There are scriptures at the end of your text for your lesson that include the um, readings for next week. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel's guide uphold you. With his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet. Till we meet. Till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet. Till we meet. God be with you till we meet again.